Hey, thank you so much, Heather, for introducing me. Um, as Heather mentioned, my name is Joanna Panetta, and I'm working with Dr. Jared Simpson uh, on trying to explore a haplotype based method to call somatic mutations using link read sequencing data. So I'll start with a brief introduction on somatic mutation calling. Uh, so somatic mutations are non-inherited genetic differences, um, and the reason why we care about them is because we're known, they're known to be associated with cancer. Um, and the task of somatic mutation calling is trying to identify um, these genetic differences. And so what that involves is distinguishing them from germline mutations, which are inherited, and artifacts uh, such as sequencing errors. So the traditional approach of doing somatic mutation calling is using this tumor normal methodology. And so the way that works is from a single individual, we collect DNA sample from a healthy, um, from a healthy blood sample and uh, tumor sample. And we pass that on to a DNA sequencer, which allows us to obtain reads. And we align that to a reference genome. And it enables us to find these genetic differences. Now, the task of the variant caller um, is to try to categorize these somatic mutations, which are, are sort of these mutations that are highlighted in these different colors. Um, and so it's trying to, to categorize them as being a somatic mutation, a germline mutation, or a sequencing error or artifact. Um, so how that is done is they normally assess the variant allele frequency. So that's the fraction of reads that are supporting that variant at that site. Um, and so using the VAF and the knowledge that the germline mutations are supposed to follow this VAF 50% for heterozygous mutations and 100% for homozygous mutations, they can categorize germline mutations. But the problem with that is trying to understand how close um, it's supposed to be to be expected to call it a germline mutation. Somatic mutations, um, oh, sorry. and in a tumor normal mode, the normal sample helps. And the idea behind using a normal is trying to see if the variants appear in the normal sample. And if that does, then it's most likely a germline mutation. On the other hand, somatic mutations um, can range in the variant allele frequency. But the problem with this one is that some somatic mutations can appear in very low allele frequencies, and that um, looks like a sequencing error. And so the challenge is trying to also identify um, between somatic mutations and errors. Another approach is using just the tumor alone. And so as the name applies, we no longer have access to the normal sample. And the motivation behind that is then we don't have to sequence the normal. Um, and this becomes even more challenging because we don't have that normal sample to distinguish germline mutations, and we still have that second problem of segregating between somatic and errors. Um, a more modern approach is a haplotype-based approach. And so this differs from the mainstream uh, methods, which use a position-based analysis. So they look at each of the positions independently and assess them um, regardless of the surrounding mutations. Whereas a haplotype-based approach takes into account variants that are inherited together um, or their phasing information. So a little work has been done to leverage this phasing information in tumor-only calling. And so that's where I come in. Um, and I use this property of somatic mutations segregating onto one haplotype, um, whereas errors do not. So the idea here is if we know the phasing information, we can identify genetic variants such as this one here that don't segregate onto a single haplotype um, and see that this one's most likely an error. So as I mentioned in the previous example, phasing information can be powerful in somatic mutation calling. Um, and so to obtain these haplotypes and phasing information, what we do is we use these heterozygous variants. And so there's an example here where these are, there are two loci with evidence for these two different um, bases. And the possible haplotypes could be that the A is inherited with the G or the T, and the same goes for the C in the first loci. Now the problem with short reads is that they, don't, they aren't able to span these heterozygous um, sites um, because the short reads can be about 150 base pairs and these heterozygous sites can be about one kilo base apart. The advantage of long reads is that we will have reads that span these heterozygous sites and from there, we can have more evidence in specific haplotypes, and we obtain this phasing information. So linked reads are generated by 10x genomics, and at its core, it's a short read sequencing technology. Um, but what's amazing about this is it utilizes molecular barcodes. Um, and from 
using this, this uh, molecular barcode, we're able to gain this long-range information that allows us to resolve these haplotypes. So the way that it works is that we have the genome and we fragment it into high molecular weight DNA fragments of approximately 50 to 100 kilobases. And we get the, using the microfluidics devices, we get approximately 10 of these high molecular weight DNA fragments into these beads that are enabling this attachment of uh, 10x barcodes. Then we pass off these DNA fragments into an Illumina sequencer um, and we obtain beads that have this barcode, which allows us to derive which DNA fragment a read is coming from. And this gets us that long range information and gets us that phasing. So the motivation behind my project is maybe we can uh, ease tumor only somatic calling by using haplotype information that's provided by linked reads. And so in this example here, where we're looking at an IGV screenshot um, of the reads being lined to the reference, um, and the genetic, the genetic differences are highlighted again in the different colors. And in the center, I've highlighted a true somatic mutation. So here, again, the idea is that we are unable to tell if this is a, uh, an error. But when we phase it by haplotypes, this is haplotype 1 and haplotype 2, we can see that this is a true somatic, or gain more confidence that this is a true somatic mutation. And so the next few slides, I'll be trying to understand this question about how calling somatic mutations differs in linked reads and in regular reads. And so in order to carry out this analysis, I obtained, we obtained some linked read whole genome sequencing on a primary tumor and a recurrent tumor uh, from a glioblastoma sample. And from there, we imposed a somatic calling uh, pipeline, imposed a true somatic calling pipeline, and we also took from that exact same sample our regular reads and also impose it in, under the same somatic calling pipeline. We additionally had this regular sequenced uh, normal sample, which enables the tumor normal mode and the tumor only mode um, comparison. And so when we ran it under this somatic mutation color called mutex1, um, and compared the number of somatic mutations in linked reads and in regular reads, we're seeing about a 35,000 uh, difference in the linked reads. So there's more somatic mutations being called in linked reads. Um, and that's fine because mutex1 isn't made for um, tumor-only calling, but when we use it in the tumor normal uh, mode, we still see that same difference in the, when we use the linked reads, and we see way more, um, way more somatic mutations. So this prompted a bunch of investigation, trying to understand why we see so many more. Um, and we did some additional filtering, and we got it down to about, uh, to a magnitude of difference. But this still is incomparable to when we use regular samples. Um, another method that tries to accomplish the same thing, uh, 10x specific um, tumor only method called Samovar, which uses machine learning. Um, we, uh, still could not find the comparable results to when we use a regular, normal tumor mode. And so this prompted a deeper investigation of these differences. And what we found was this trend of a multinucleotide variant. So this is where consecutive base substitutions of two or more appear. And it seemed to be just appearing in the linked read data. So in the two panels here, we see this G and T in the center um, that just appear in the linked reads, but not in the regular um, sample. And what we noticed was that a lot of the reads that seemed to be carrying the evidence for, um, for these uh, multinucleotide variants seem to have soft click bases. And that's where the mapper tries to force the alignment um, by trimming off the ends of reads that don't seem to be matching at that, at that site. And so we wanted to investigate um, where these soft click bases are coming from. Um, and so we align the reads to the reference genome. And so this is a read that seems to be supporting a, a false positive, and the false positive is here, and the soft click bases are here. And so this part of the read seems to be aligning to a different portion um, nearby to uh, where, the original, where the original read was mapped to. Um, and so these seem to be coming from nearby locations on a, a reverse strand. To understand the underlying mechanism of why this kind of um, read occurs, we impose it under this um, secondary structure analysis um, called Enfold. And for every read that supported this false positive mutation, we tried to see if there was possibility of it to fold over on itself. 
What was interesting was a lot of the reads seemed to do that, and at the apex of the hairpins was where we were seeing these false positive mutations. So linked read whole genome sequencing, to generate them, it actually uses this multiple displacement amplification technique. Um, and in previous literature, what we're seeing is that um, they have a possibility of creating these chimeric reads, in very chimeric reads, that seem to be similar to what we're seeing um, when we're looking at the false positives. Um, and so we tried to investigate um, how, we can, how we can find these chimeras. And we developed a novel tool called 10x trim, which aims to identify these chimeric reads um, using overlap detection. And the code is available on GitHub. The main idea behind this is motivated by, um, by looking at these hairpin structures. And what we noticed was that the sequences, um, what we do is the sequences seem to overlap with its reverse complement. And so what we would do is we perform an overlap detection between the original sequence and its reverse complement. And we find that um, if the overlap is sufficient enough, 10x trim um, is applied and tries to trim off the reads up until the overlap point, which seems to carry out these false positive mutations. And uh, in order to determine the um, if we should trim it, we use this overlap scoring scheme, which is a function of um, the number of matches and the number of mismatches um, that occur in this overlap. And so to identify these inverted chimeras, we calculated overlap um, between its inverse complement and the original sequence. And if the overlap score is high, we apply this um, methodology of trimming um, to the read. And so how many reads were trimmed was the next question. Um, and so we found that about 8% of the reads seem to be trimmed, um, which is much higher than when we look at the regular um, samples. Um, we also tried to see how this affected the somatic mutation tolerance. And so what we found after trimming was there was about a 10,000 different, 10,000 difference um, when we applied 10x trim. And so conclusions. Um, so in, in um, the first part, I've mentioned that we found differences in the number of somatic mutations being called in linked reads versus regular reads. We found that a lot of these reads seem to be showing chimeric traits, um, and we developed a novel tool called 10x trim in order to identify these um, chimeras, and it was effective in reducing the number of false positives. In future, it would be it would be interesting to see how a haplotype sorting can be used on other long read data such as PacBio and Oxford Nanopore. And I'd really like to thank uh, the members of the Simpson Lab, the Pew Lab, Taylor Lab, or Sarah Genomics and Bioinformatics uh, for all their help and advice in supporting the research. Thank you. <laughs>